I'd like to start now by introducing our first panelist, Joe Dabrowski, my colleague at the PLSA, who heads up our policy work on DV, LGPS, and standards. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is the first of a, a series of seminars that will be, or webinars that we'll be running. Um, I think for many of us, this is a, this is a first through this format, so um, uh, fingers crossed, and uh, I've closed the door so the kids can't run in and interrupt, uh, much like that famous BBC video. Um, so we're going to talk through some top tips uh, shortly, but first of all, I wanted to start with a little bit of background to some of the things that we at the PLSA have been doing over recent couple of weeks, which uh, have gone by uh, incredibly fast. There's been a huge amount to do and a huge amount changing constantly for, for us and of course, uh, most importantly for you. Um, so just to, just to recap some of those things that we'll be doing, some of the things that we'll be doing uh, going forward as well. Um, so we've been taking the opportunity to engage with members to understand uh, how COVID-19 is affecting day-to-day -day running of schemes, uh, some of the challenges around sponsors and also how that's impacting the LGPS sector in particular. Um, we've been talking to our policy board and committees to assess where people see the priorities and, and the challenges and also been surveying members. We've had one survey so far and we'll touch upon a little bit of the results today um, but there'll be more to come and one to follow this uh, webinar to get a little bit more granular detail into some of the things that you're you're facing. Um, particular things that we've been doing alongside that have been liaising closely with government and regulators, uh, that's uh, engaging with ministers, officials, uh, senior people at all the regulators to understand where they are, uh, how we can feed into that process and some of the things that might be coming next. Uh, that's gone very well so far, they have been uh, definitely listening and they've responded well um, some of the things that we have asked for, they've uh, engaged with particularly. So commitment to uh, maintaining AE and the uh, introduction of some of the support through the government uh, support for contributions through uh, including the furlough scheme, uh, the freeze on the 10% increase in the general levy, extensions to the DB funding regime, uh, increased guidance and flexibility uh, around DRCs and generally uh, a lot of pragmatism coming from regulators on, on all fronts, uh, it, uh, and long may that continue. Um, a couple of things that have come up from uh, member feedback that we definitely want to see a lot more as we go forward uh, and as this process uh, continues. Um, lots more flexibility around greater, uh, about some of the kind of day-to-day -day deadlines uh, where flexibility might be needed, uh, accepting things are going to be more difficult than normal. Um, and other things that we'll be looking at include uh, the PPF levy, uh, challenges uh, for the LGPS sector around uh, annual benefit statements and other areas such as that. Um, so lots to engage with, um, lots of forums that we're continuing to uh, participate in and we'll continue to give you updates through Policy Watch, through webinars and through other sessions to um, understand your needs and how we can support them. Um, so that's a very quick run through to some of the things that we're doing overall. Um, and now uh, dip into some of the top tips. Uh, a little bit of the material here, there's a lot more material online and uh, the panelists are also going to share their expert, experience, uh, expert opinions and experiences of uh, life so far following the disruption through COVID. So just to uh, click through. Let's... And then we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of things on the administration side where we think it's going to be important to spend some time focusing on. Um, guidance from the FCA and others uh, indicates that for sure pension schemes uh, and some of their workers qualify as key workers. Um, and that gives you an opportunity if you're running in-house uh, to have support workers there, making sure that key issues such as uh, benefit, pay <clears throat> benefit payments, 
uh, people coming up to retirement and, and bereavements can be dealt with uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, seamless fashion as much as possible. But we think for those also using third party administrators, uh, there's, a, there's a question to be asked um, around your providers, um, how many of their staff qualify as key workers, what does that look like uh, over the short, medium and long term, how resilient is that to, for example, uh, if heightened levels of um, illness as a result of COVID and the coronavirus, and what does that do? Um, so you can be clear about the level of supply you're going to be getting, uh, level of support you're going to be getting, and, and how that might be uh, managed going forward. Um, I think the other thing that drawing out from administrators that can focus on immediately is key core financial transaction data, by which we mean uh, are people being paid, uh, are they being paid on time, uh, and how is how is that uh, how are those metrics looking um, if there is increasing pressure on your provider? Um, that will give you some important kind of context as to how things are holding up, but also give you some reassurance um, as to whether um, your members are being served uh, appropriately and whether you need to potentially adjust any of the processes you put in place. Um, that feeds through to lots of other things. So, um, you, you know, if you're going to see uh, some increased pressure on general payments being made, um, that's going to feed through to increased calls, increased anxiety for members. And it's important at this time, uh, especially that uh, people can rely on their uh, pension benefits being paid uh, and being uh, dealt with as, as smoothly as possible. Um, I think the key thing is accept some flexibility uh, in SLAs at this time. You're not going to see a kind of seamless service, but you need those core actions being dealt with and you need to be comfortable that you're going to get um, support and the resilience is there if, if things get a little bit more squeezed again. Um, you know, that kind of feeds through to making sure your administrator's got a clear sense of your priorities. Uh, there isn't a sort of one size fits all model. There are lots of uh, commonalities that schemes might face, um, but you may have slightly different uh, needs than, than other schemes. So make sure your administrator does know what you are really focused on. Um, if necessary, you can check that back through your documentation to see where your, uh, where your obligations uh, fall within your contract. Um, you want to be clear about your messaging for your administrator to your member query, for your member queries to uh, how has that been dealt with? We've seen lots of call contact centers be uh, closed down and moved to online. How is that process working? If it is up and running, what are the key messages you want getting across to your members? You may have uh, work workers in a particular t industry and that industry might be something that's facing increased pressure at the moment. Retail, for example, uh, certain types of retail, um, for example, might be under more pressure or leisure industries. Um, so you might want different messages depending on your context. Um, so make sure that that's happening. Um, transfer value process is uh, obviously a key issue. We've seen guidance from the pensions regulator that has indicated that you can take a view as to whether you want to uh, slow down that transfer process uh, for a couple of months, just take some, uh, put some additional steps in to prevent um, scamming or to prevent some uh, pressures on cash flow or, you, or even just uh, pressures on people there to do the work. Um, so have a think about how your transfer process, uh, what you want to do, whether you want to kind of uh, try and carry on as normal, whether you want to take things a little bit slower. Um, but I think the key thing that we've seen from all the regulators and from MAPS and one of the things that we hear a lot about from members is heightened risk of scams at the moment. So make sure that you have got protections in place around the transfer process. Um, and if needs be, also go away and have a check on your uh, trustee and roles to see whether you need to make any adjustments to the uh, uh, actuarial calculations that underpin the transfer values that you might be offering at the moment if you are proceeding down that route. Um, death benefits, um, you know, you want to be clear, does your death benefits policy cover COVID-19? If it doesn't, what kind of situation are you in? Uh, do you have external policies that you need to double check on? And in the LGPS is a particular issue um, where you need to be mindful that if you've got staff that have been drawn back in um, to provide healthcare, whether that's through uh, local authorities or for um, the NHS, but yet they have an NHS pension. There's an issue there about 
where the uh, where the cover comes from um, and how that works, and that's something that uh, we're talking to the Scheme Advisor Board and others about. Um, so a few key things to think about. So moving through to the next slide. Just having a little technical issue here. Now IT help with that. Okay, great. Uh, so communications, obviously key element of uh, the situation at the moment, communicating with members, being very clear about uh, what's happening with the scheme, uh, if necessary, what's happening with the company uh, and having those channels open, whether that's through online, uh, web, or if it's still possible, paper. Um, uh, key area, as I mentioned just before, scams, lots of, uh, lots of heightened risk there. So make sure that's covered off as part of your communications. Um, consider your financial advice offering. So if you are offering some uh, services around um, people coming at, at, up to retirement, people who are thinking about a transfer, just think about how that fits together with the current situation and what you can do to make that as smooth and as appropriate as possible given the, given the changing circumstances. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of kind of steps to be put in place uh, across the piece to protect members from poor outcomes, but just drawing out some uh, areas to focus on in, in, in DC in particular. Um, and I think Laura will touch on, on DC a little bit more uh, uh, shortly, but uh, you might see members uh, you know, reading stories about the, uh, the, the stock market bouncing around, possibly making uh, hasty decisions um, around the default, around opting in and out. So uh, focusing communications on, on that uh, and helping people to uh, navigate the kind of complex environment uh, as best as possible will be, will be important um, because they could really make uh, poor choices based on uh, poor information. So do what you can to fill that gap and uh, Protect, uh, protect the scheme and protect the uh, savers. So uh, clearly funding is going to be a, a big question uh, going forward, but also immediately where there are some pressures uh, going to be falling on participating employees in, in the LGPS. Uh, there are going to be pressures on sponsors uh, who have either just completed evaluation or going through evaluation process or even those who might have been pouring over the uh, DB funding code before it was uh, suspended or pushed back rather. Um, so, you know, in all these situations when you've got a very uh, mobile kind of environment, an environment that's moving very fast, key to have a good two-way engagement with your sponsor or your uh, participating employers um, you know, what is their situation? Uh, are they feeling um, that they're going to need to ask you about deferring deficit recovery contributions, deferring payments? Have they approached you about potentially uh, altering uh, AE contribution scheduling and timing as well? Lots of those kind of questions bound to be coming up. That conversation needs to be dynamic. Um, you need to be able to make sure that you understand the immediate pressure and the pressures uh, or challenges that might come thereafter. Uh, that's going to inform your decision. Um, there have historically been sometimes been challenges about getting information from employers in this kind of situation. Uh, you want to make sure you've got up-to-date information so you can make a judgment on how you're going to act uh, in an informed way rather than uh, something that might potentially be based on uh, information that's quickly going out to date, out of date uh, if the covenant in particular is under stress. Um, you know, around, around the same time, you're going to be needing to prioritise uh, the issues that you want to discuss with your scheme actuary around the valuation, around the funding, around covenant. Um, you know, there will be some things that are, are really important at this time and other things that you, you, know, you can push back for a little while. Just uh, make sure you're using the resources that you have to hand as, as best as possible in, in a kind of really targeted fashion. 
Um, many of you might have been considering a buy-in or buy-out. Uh, pricing is bound to be affected by the current situation. You might find you, uh, you get a very favorable deal or you might find the, the deals moved from you uh, in, in some way or other. Just make sure you've got, a, uh, got that conversation going on and you understand what's happening. Um, there, will be, there may be opportunities uh, out there that you uh, wouldn't otherwise have seen. Um, TPR has updated its guidance on DRCs um, in the last week or so, just giving a sense that uh, it is possible to um, delay contributions uh, if the circumstances are right, though. I think that's the key thing. The circumstances have to be right. There are various steps that they have recommended. Make sure you go through that kind of diligence process um, and take a, take a decision based on that because, um, you know, you don't want it to come back and bite you at some future date. Um, so take a look at the guidance, make sure you keep up to date with the guidance because we are seeing uh, weekly changes. So just a few pointers on governance. Um, we've, we've had uh, some interesting conversations with members about some of the governance challenges that they faced over the last couple of weeks. I think uh, very many of us have, have gotten to know Zoom very quickly or other uh, providers, at, you know, Microsoft Teams and others suddenly holding uh, virtual meetings rather than um, in-person meetings. Um, so make sure that you've got the kind of structures in place to uh, enable those meetings to take place in the short term, but also in the long term. I think everybody can pretty much do uh, and get by with the uh, quick solutions uh, over the short term, but if, if we're facing some disruption for the longer term, there may be things that are harder to do, um, in particular virtually. So make sure you've got kind of structure for that. Make sure your governance uh, processes flow through as well. Um, you know, whether that's trustee, whether that's supporting committees, whether that's how you interact between your pensions committee and your pensions board and your pool in the LGPS. There are a lot of governance challenges and, and there's a lot to think through. Um, so make sure you have uh, the time to do that and also you know, check it fits with your rules. Uh, do your rules allow you to do all the things that you might want to do at this time? It won't always be the case that they do. Uh, you might have issues around core, you might have uh, all kinds of other issues that are more kind of day to day like having wet signatures for certain things. Lots of things to think about. Um, I think key obviously prioritizing actions uh, at this time. I think everybody's probably started on that, but um, making sure you've really got, you know, there's four or five things that you can deal with uh, over the short term and really concentrate efforts on that. Um, Cybersecurity is obviously something that's come up more and more over the last uh, couple of years as a thing to watch out for. Um, I think with more of us working from home, uh, we have to be mindful that uh, cybersecurity uh, might be different uh, and might have different implications. Uh, not everybody will necessarily have uh, access through remote and secure servers. You might be needing to deal with people through their Gmail or other accounts uh, from time to time. That isn't gonna be the same level of security that you would have otherwise. You might be exchanging papers and, uh, and content in different forms. Member data in particular is gonna be uh, a high risk and, and uh, obviously high interest to people who might want to either fish your information from you by uh, cyber attacks or, or by other means. Just really be careful about that cyber issue. Make sure you've got clear processes and they're being followed. It's easy to lose track of them being followed at, at distance, probably much more than being in the office. Um, lots of deadlines for various things coming up. So PPF is uh, levy, levy uh, guidance detail, uh, contingent asset reporting, and that's that's been recently, there will be other things, just make sure you keep an eye on some of those things because they could easily slip by and, and that sort of thing will cost you later, um, especially potentially PPO contingent assets. Um, don't wanna get caught with that late. Um, employer contributions, um, something where members have been either willing to accept some flex or being quite concerned about uh, employers approaching for uh, additional flexibility around moving uh, employer contributions to dates of their choosing rather than the um, uh, backs or other payments that have been set up. Something, something to look out for. Uh, you know, if you're seeing big changes there, that's really uh, gonna set some alarm bells ringing 
you would be wanting to make sure you can manage that holistically, that, that kind of overall picture. Uh, you might you might accept one or two employers with a bit more flex, but if everybody's doing it, what kind of position does that put you in? Uh, and how are people using it to manage their cash flow issues? Uh, potentially uh, uh, some risky behaviors could occur. So, so definitely something to, to keep an eye on. Um, lots of things to think about kind of on the investment side. Uh, we've seen all those bumpy markets. Um, lots of DB schemes will have been pretty well hedged, um, uh, but there will be a proportion of the market that, that won't be. Um, you need to make sure you're clear about how that's, uh, how that's impacting you, whether the decisions you want to make about your uh, asset strategy in, in the short term uh, and what that might look, additional calls and liquidity might mean. Um, DC schemes, obviously a lot to focus on around the default. We talked a little bit about member choices. Uh, I think Laura will touch a bit more on this as well. Um, but certainly to, to watch out for how things are, are moving and what actions people are taking. And also, uh, you know, most people will have a close eye on their default strategy, and certainly in the very largest schemes, but don't, don't let that slip if there is uh, something that you need to, need to do. Um, investment opportunities, it doesn't always kind of instantly spring to mind when it feels like the uh, world is falling apart around us, but um, definitely there will be some investment opportunities out there. Make sure you're scanning for those opportunities because um, you, you may be able to... Uh, uh, do extremely well by the scheme and, 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 and take those where they arise. You might have to act very rapidly in this kind of environment too. So key thing for that is making sure you've got your governance structures set up. So if you need to make quick decisions, you can, and you can be confident that you're going to do so based on the right information. That kind of leads back to all those uh, kind of governance questions and getting those ducks in a row where you can. Um, lastly, uh, Implications for AGM season, a lot of this has gone kind of virtual at the moment, but please uh, do make sure you carry out your stewardship duties as best you can. I think we've seen some interesting pressure on companies uh, to make sure that large uh, executive remuneration uh, packages don't get uh, doled out at this time. And also there's been lots of questions around uh, where people are going to be making dividend pension payments, which uh, pension schemes will often uh, benefit from. Um, so, so keep an eye on your stewardship duties. That's that stuff to uh, to make sure you do continue to do and don't let slide at this time. Great. Um, thanks for that, Joe. Um, while Joe was speaking, I've sent everyone a link to our DB LGPS and DC top tips guide. So it's in the chat box for you. Um, and the next speaker is Laura Myers. Laura's head of defined contribution at LCP, the consultancy. She's also a member of our policy board, and she's going to give some specific tips for trust-based and then for corporate-based DC schemes. Hello, Laura. Hi, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to start with my top five tips for trust-based schemes. So as Joe was saying, really, I think business continuity and admin is going to be the key, most important thing to making sure that your scheme continues to run in this environment. Your administrator and your provider are probably now working from home, but hopefully you've had detailed conversations with your provider about how that's working. But also you need to look to the future. So thinking about actually if quite a lot of your um, provider or administrators um, the, um, the staff there was actually off sick, large numbers of people couldn't actually work from home. What would that mean for your scheme and really have those um, positions in place and understand that with your provider? For example, how is that going to impact the helplines if members are concerned? We've already seen a number of helplines already close or significantly scale down. Think about how that's going to change in the future. And also things like postage. If you're posting out annual benefit statements, how is that going to be impacted? Is it now and in the future if a lot of people can't continue to work on your scheme? So really, I would make sure that you have a plan in place, prioritise business as usual things so that members can actually continue to get contributions into the scheme, get those retirement death benefit payments out of the scheme. Um, and think about actually, are there some projects that maybe you don't need to do right now? So for example, an asset transfer, is that something that you need to put additional strain on your administrator for? And think about whether any kind of projects could be delayed to give them a little bit more breathing space and room. 
So that's probably the most important point to think about. As we were saying, as Joe was saying about investments, I think the key thing from a DC strategy perspective is the default. Um, we've had some really turbulent times over the last um, month or so. So really think how has that default performed? If you're lifestyling towards um, a member's target retirement age, has that worked? Has it protected members in those years towards retirement? So take a look at that and think about your investment strategy. If you've got things such as property funds in self-select ranges over the last few weeks, you may have been dealing with suspensions in those funds that haven't been able to receive valuations. If that's impacted you, you've probably had to look at diverting contributions away from the property fund as you could no longer invest into it potentially. Um, and that's um, had quite a number of issues, such as potentially creating a default if you're moving contributions without asking permission for members. So think about exactly how that's going to be working in the long term. So now is a good time to put a plan in place if you've had um, issues with property funds and other funds. Think about how are you going to put that into your SIP, into your annual chair statement, and make sure you're seeking legal advice on that. But also I take a moment to take stock and think actually when we do return to normal and these funds are open, how you're going to deal with that, what communications you're going to send to members, are you going to think about re-diverting contributions back into the property fund for those members? So lots to think about there. As Joe said earlier, communications is going to be such a key thing to members. So much has changed in people's lives that really I think it's very important to make sure there's information there on the pensions um, when members need it. Particularly, as I've said previously, lots of helplines are closed now. There needs to be ways that members can access information. So make sure that you're communicating about volatile markets, about the fact that pensions are long term and providing those key messages to members. And it's awful to say it, but as Joe said earlier, scams, scams are becoming more and more prevalent. So make sure that really you have got some detailed communications and that your processes are in place from that perspective. Um, even with a trust-based scheme, I think it's still important to think about the impact on your employer. So really do work together, um, particularly if the employee is furloughing any, um, any employees. So think about the communications that the employer is sending out and really link those to those in the scheme to make sure that you're providing members with good information. Um, also think about how payroll is functioning. Are uh, they still managing to send over contributions to the administrator or provider and how that works in these difficult times of business continuity. And finally, I just wanted to touch on board governance. Um, this is our new normal now, as we were saying, we're all going used to um, doing um, video conferences. Um, but do you think about actually when you're looking at your business plan for the next meeting, what are the requirements that are nice to have? What is re the regulatory um, necessity and what projects need to happen? So really prioritise and spend your time effectively. So they are my top five quick tips for, um, for um, trust um, based schemes for corporates with um, DC schemes. I think there's some similar key points. You should be looking at that business continuity on your admin and payroll functions to make sure the scheme still runs. Look at the investment strategy, ask the trustees and the providers if they're going to make any changes, particularly if that's not worked effectively over the last few months when it's been these testing times. And then thinking about making sure the providers providing communication to your employees. But also an additional point here to think about is if you are one of those um, employers that actually has life assurance based on membership of the pension scheme to make sure that you're communicating that that is very clearly communicated to employees. As if they're opting out of the pension scheme, they could be opting out of life cover at this point. Obviously, that might be something that, that is an unintended consequence that they don't realise. So really make sure that you've, that you've communicated those key points. I think for corporates, the bigger issue here is around furloughing employees and having to continue to pay automatic enrolment contributions. Um, so um, AE law does still apply. 
Um, if you are furloughing employees, you do still need to pay the contributions on the, on the new amount that they're being paid. So for example, if you're, you're taking up the job retention scheme and your employees only have eight, are getting now paid 80% of what they were, you will be paying your contribution amounts on that 80%. We have seen some corporates like topping up um, paying the additional 20%, so then you would still be paying the full automatic enrolment contributions. So that's a really key point to think about in terms of your costs, particularly as um, the job retention scheme only covers automatic enrolment, so 3% on qualifying earnings. So a lot of people will be paying on basic pay rather than qualifying earnings, so, the, so you will need to top up that additional amount, both in terms of if you're paying it, the contributions above automatic minimums and if you pay on say basic pay rather than qualifying earnings. So quite a lot to think about there. And finally, the one to think about for other businesses is if you have, for example, paying staff on um, qualifying earnings and um, for example, supermarkets, you'll be seeing people with extra shifts. Potentially some people have been offered pay increases to actually continue going to work. Um, these things would then count for pension contributions. So it's not just your wages that will increase, it's also your pension contributions. So just to make sure you factor that in. So they were my top five tips for corporates. Great. Thank you, Laura. That's a huge, fantastic overview of DC. Really, really glad that you were able to do that today. Um, Stuart Hasty, a partner at Isaiah Pensions, um, is now going to give an overview of some specific areas for DB funds. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, Rachel. Thank you um, for the introduction. Nice to meet everybody, or meet everybody virtually. Um, yes, I thought, um, just from a DB point of view, the, the thought would start with just saying that the, um, I think this crisis is a bit different to what we've been used to or had in, in the past. And there's kind of three areas. One, it's, it's very human in nature, uh, very personal. Um, the second thing is the speed at which you know, things have developed. I mean, in the matter of weeks, we've gone to um, three billion people around the globe effectively in lockdown. Um, and then the third is the breadth, the, the kind of, and I mean that from not just a geographical point of view, but across so many different sectors. Um, and, and the reason I say that is I think it needs to inform perhaps how we react to this, this crisis from a, from a pensions point of view. Um, and we, within this year, have been essentially trying to structure our thoughts into these kind of three broad areas, particularly for DB, around pensions finances, so funding level and investment strategy, um, operational risks, including governance, uh, which you know, clearly affects uh, pretty much most schemes, uh, and then the impact uh, on the business, the covenant, the employer covenant. And I think a lot of schemes will be in different places on both the, the pensions finances in terms of funding level, depending on the investment strategy, the level of hedging, the equity investment uh, and investment in other assets that have been hit. Um, and in different funding levels to start with. Uh, and of course, um, different schemes will have different types of covenant. Um, and some businesses are more affected than others. But I think one of the things that is definitely um, coming through already is this understanding of there may be an immediate impact in lots of cases, um, but actually that this, the, the impact of this crisis may be with us for a few years to come, uh, particularly for some industries. I mean, an example of this would be that factories have started to start again, manufacturing started up again in China but um, who's buying the stuff that they're producing? Because actually a lot of the shops are closed still. So, you know, the, there are, and I've got uh, organizations that I know that aren't just thinking about the shops that are close today, but what are they going to be doing with shifting the stock um, in the, in the, over the next year? And actually the ramifications of this, even if we get a fairly quick turnaround and back to normal, um, could last for at least uh, two years or three years, potentially, from, a, from an individual. All right, have we lost Stuart? 
No, I'm back. Sorry. That's what happens when you go through your iPad <laughs> and your mobile phone phones you at the same time. Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> um, I think it's becoming the norm, isn't it, to have some kind of tech disruption in every meeting and uh, people being more forgiving. I, I hopefully won't have any of my three kids running in at some point and trying to take over the presentation. Um, the um, sorry. So um, yeah, the, the the point I think the, one of the areas that I think for trustees there will be the kind of focus on the immediate in terms of covenant uh, impact or employer impact, but also understanding what are you know recognizing that things are very uncertain, but understanding um, what the impact might be longer term is also going to be an important aspect, um, uh, 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 and what the best guess of of, of how quickly the, the business could recover. Um, so that's the kind of what the kind of the three kind of broad categories and then in terms of what we're seeing or suggesting um you know the, the, we've got kind of four kind of broad areas so being pragmatic i mean i think being pragmatic is clearly uh, an obvious and we've seen already uh, i think a lot of the the proactive response from the pensions regulator is very much stressing um our pragmatism you know the fact that they're talking about um deferral of or suspending cash contributions into DB schemes, essentially almost up for a period of three months whilst you work out what's going on and get, gain extra inf information. And essentially, applying, I think trustees applying uh, more of the 80 to making decisions, not necessarily gonna be able to provide, uh, be able to make decisions on full information, um, but being able to do the best they can with what they've got. Uh, the second one, also um, probably fairly obvious to a lot of people, is uh, prioritisation. Um, not just focusing on what a DB scheme needs to do, um, but also perhaps what they need to stop doing, um, whether that's not non-essential projects or, or even um, certain things that might be quite risky, like uh, any major asset transitions, uh, for example, at the moment. Um, I think the, th the third and fourth area is perhaps less less obvious, but but I think being member led. I mean, this, as, as I said before, this is a very human crisis, um, and and obviously pension schemes only exist for the benefit really of their their members. Um, but really, are we thinking about what are the stakeholders? Are the stakeholders involved? Looking at what members not just want, but also what they really need. Um, and there might be some examples from. Um, some of the employers out there about what how they're looking after their staff um, and, and and what what role and what uh, approach can pension schemes take to looking after their members I know a lot of pension schemes are already looking in terms of their communications around how can they help prioritize how can they direct members either to um, um, online tools um, or into um, Call cool, uh, um, voicemail, which essentially then helps to prioritise what what where, what the admin team is dealing with. Um, and then, lastly, um, I think looking at being forward-looking, and when when sorting, um, having sorted the immediate issues, um, really thinking about uh, what um, the three areas really the opportunities that might come out after this. We know from previous crises that some um, asset markets will tend to get. Um, oversold so how is the scheme positioned to take advantage of some of those opportunities um, the second thing would be around what lessons um, are we learning or can we learn um, I think particularly in the areas of probably administration and operation um, that we can carry forward and learn from and then the last thing um, plan for when things really do turn around and I know there's a lot of pressure on government right now around what's the exit strategy when things do start to to kind of uh, play out again the question is for pension schemes are you thinking about what where you're going to be uh, when things do start to um, turn around so that's really our top tips from a from a DB point of view thanks Stuart that's great really appreciate it um, and now I'm happy to welcome Neil Mason he's a member of the PLSA's policy board and he's also the head of pensions at Surrey County Council and Neil is going to discuss some specific areas for local authority funds to consider so over to you, Neil. Uh, thank, thank you, Rachel. And uh, I've seen an, an, a number of friends and colleagues on this call, so I think I'll start with just wishing you all well in these very strange times that we're living in. Um, I, I'm, I'm a novice in dealing with pandemics as a pension fund manager, as we all are. 
Um, so I don't pretend to give you any expertise here. Um, and I'm equally helpful to, to hear what, what, what friends and colleagues have, have got to say in, this, in this, these challenging times. Um, I, I, th I thought I'd start with, with how we've approached uh, this situation at Surrey. Um, and and re immediately we, we, we sort of analyzed the risks in, in all the key areas. But, but before I did that, I wanted to just, just any colleagues who don't know, and uh, uh, excuse me if you, you've already heard this, but there's some really ex excellent resources out there for funds. Um, the LGA and the Scheme Advisory Board have provided a, a huge amount of links uh, and Q&As for employers, for, uh, for administrators and, and, and most importantly for members and, and, I, and I recommend you, you, you go on that, that site immediately and, and, and look what, what's on there. Um, another few examples is that uh, the PASA guidance for administrators has, has been really fantastic, uh, really helps administrators in trying to, trying to risk assess this, 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 this situation. Um, I've been really, uh, really pleasantly surprised and, 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 and impressed with what the, the pensions regulator have done. A really pragmatic and sensible approach and, uh, and I'd, I'd recommend you look at uh, there of the advice they've given up and obviously our sponsors, uh, uh, the PLSA, th this, is, this is really useful um, advice that, uh, that they're providing in, the, in, in, their, in their literature. And finally, uh, use your trade unions as well. Um, if, if members and trade unions are, have been really helpful and, and proactive in, in, in their communications. So, so uh, sorry, we, we base our analysis in, in four areas, funding, investment, governance, and delivery. And again, I'll, ju I'll just touch on some areas that we've highlighted uh, during the time. And, and there's our, our risk register. I've, I've just we try to, to, to grade all our risks. We, we look at a risk register almost on a daily basis now, but I did, I did, I did say we'd, we'd review it weekly, but we seem to be reviewing it almost all the time at the moment, just, just as, as this situation evolves. And we, we share it with our, with our chairs of our, our local pensions board and our pension fund committee so that, so that they're, they're constantly involved in this process. Uh, so starting um, with funding risk, um, Clearly, um, there are going to be a number of smaller employers and even larger employers actually in, in distress. Um, and we, we've written a policy, uh, sorry, for, for deferred payments, but, but we, it needs to be, again, it needs to be sensible. It, it, it's all very well looking at a, an employer in distress and talking about three months deferment, but if they are actually skin and going out of business, we need to be pragmatic and sensible about this. And, and, and so will the pensions regulator. So, so the, looking at the covenant, is one thing, but but it won't be a one size fits all uh, approach. Um, we've just had the 2019 valuation. We've all set discount rates for that valuation. They're likely going to be way out, um, and we need to we need to address that. We need to speak to our actuaries as soon as as possible. That any any new entrance to the scheme, there may still be planned academy conversions. We we need to look at how how those those conversions happen. How that how that transfer is working, and there might be exits, so we need to make sure that we've got we've got the right uh, discount rate and behind that um, that calculation, and we need to speak to our actuaries as soon as possible as uh, about the cash flow impact this is going to have. Some for some schemes, this is going to tip us over um, into a cash flow negative position. Moving on to investment risk again, I'll I'll talk about cash flow. Uh, this is not a time to be selling assets, but that it may be that we have to uh, to, to, to make to make sure that we're, we're we're funding our benefits. We need to look at our investment strategies. They are, again, they're likely that those that we set up in our most funds, certainly on a, a section um, thirteen basis, were, were, were in, in in surplus, um, and that that situation is not likely to be the case anymore. So we, we need to speak to our advisors, look at our investment strategy, uh, and ensure that we that it's that's still relevant. Uh, if we've got, uh, there's been a huge movement of, uh, of assets to, towards private markets in, generally across the scheme um, in the last, uh, in the last uh, investment strategy statements that, that went with the 2019 valuation. That, that brings with it its own liquidity concerns, so, so we need to look at that as well. And if we are moving, moving um, assets around, they're going to be currently with much higher uh, trans transaction costs. 
and then governance risks, it's going to be different for, for a lot of um, authorities and how they've got their scheme of delegations and their constitution set up. But well, let's face it, our, our meetings with our trustees, our committee and our local boards are likely to be disrupted. Let's let's communicate with them quickly, um, work on, on, on key items. Um, some of the other stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll have to find ways of, of working that through ensure that we've got agility in our in our decision making um make sure that the, the councils are, are well set up for that and the, the biggest item on our agenda as as lgps funds in the last three or four years has been has been pooling or that that is the transition is likely to be delayed in that area and finally delivery which which, which i'll include administration in that there are going to be challenges to to uh, to the um, moving a council to remote working is is not the same for all it's 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 not the same as a lot of corporate schemes we're not necessarily designed for that they're going to be it issues there, there are going to be productivity uh, effects on all of this um and we need to be mindful of mental health of of our staff and in in local government there's in my team as well that there's been a redeployment of our staff into into more frontline services supporting the the response to this to this crisis I've, I've seen in one of the questions from 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 uh, from, from those watching here there's there is key person risk you, we need to put in plans for, for if if senior officers or senior members of the board or committee are are, are unable to, to 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 act that those contingencies need to be put in place that there's a there's a issue with uh, with value in our assets particularly in alternatives um, and, and real estate so we need to be speaking to the FRC now and, and, and working out how we're going to navigate this, this, this problem. Our administration team will need to prioritise key, uh, key areas of, of performance at this time and, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, deaths and pension payments, though those type of things are really important at this time and need to be prioritised. And we need to be aware that the, the, that our communications is really important with with our uh, our pensions members they're going to be an anxious about this 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 moment and and we need to be in, in con constant communication with them and also our committee our board our other stakeholders the employers and funds it's important that we make sure our communication is clear and and, and as or as clear as it can be in this in this really difficult period and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just all these different things I'm supposed to be communicating with now. Um, so yeah, a week ago I didn't even know what any of these things meant, but now you know I could name them a quiz. But so yeah, communications is a is an ongoing challenge to um, uh, to our everyday life, uh, and also we all get invited to lots of these webinars. It's like the conference season every day now, um, so we need to prioritise our times on these as well, and this one being a high priority, obviously. And I don't know what the normal is going to be, so I haven't really put that on the slide. But but some of the some of the questions that we we get asked after this this all happens and and and, and we, it comes to a conclusion, um, the, the LGPS is going to be looked at potentially differently. Uh, we we our active managers are really going to need to earn their corn now, and if they don't, when that question of passive versus active is going to come again, and the ways of working are definitely going to change. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks for that, Neil. So speaking of prioritizing time, we're going to run this webinar a little bit past three because we have a lot of questions and we still have a bit more PLSA content we're hoping to cover. So I'm going to go back to Joe Dabrowski, who's going to tell you a little bit about results of our survey and also ask all of you watching some survey questions. So over to you, Joe, for the fast version of the survey. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I think most, most of you may have seen the survey that we Put out very shortly after sort of everything uh, blew up. I'm just going to quickly run through some of the uh, feedback of that and, and then going to kind of follow up with you guys um, just to really test where you think things are now. Um, I think that speed of the world changing around us is important and whether we still feel how we felt two weeks ago, as, as Neil said, uh, looking at his risk register every, every day, does it still feel the same and how, how sustainable does everything feel? So, uh, quick run through and then there's going to be some quick polling questions for you to answer. I'm going to give you not much time to answer, but really great to have your, your feedback when that comes through. So um, get your clickers ready. So we ran a survey between the uh, 20th and 25th of March. Uh, we had 100 respondents, which is uh, 
good feedback in, in, in a very kind of pressing period and over a short compressed time. Um, here's a summary of some of the uh, answers that we saw, uh, particularly focusing on uh, how people had felt there had been an increase in uh, member inquiries. Um, obviously there was a lot of news about things changing, but where were people picking that, picking that up? Um, so we saw uh, some funds were seeing a really uh, big increase, so, but, but pretty modest, only 4%, um, where everybody else was, was kind of seeing a little bit or, or not too much change. So um, you know, some pick up, some interest, but maybe people were focusing on, on other issues immediately. Um, this was uh, a question we wanted to see, oh, too fast, uh, see how people were doing with contingency plans and how people felt they were holding up. I think everybody has always planned for short outages, not long outages, so um, interesting to see how people were feeling. Uh, very good uh, kind of response here that everybody was actually feeling very well or, or fairly well prepared and that everything was holding up. Um, in a minute, we'll see if that still feels the same. Uh, and then question about how people are feeling about uh, employer uh, or sponsor or um, however that description might apply to you, depending on your circumstances. Um, more of a mixed bag, but uh, you know, a little bit of slightly concerned and somewhat concerned, probably taking up the kind of bulk with a little bit uh, more spread at the extremes. Um, We've seen, I think, since the survey first came out, we've seen more stringent measures put in on um, social distancing, people staying at home, and so some of this will have had uh, a bigger impact and people will have begun to think about some of the longer term consequences if uh, the uh, situation carries on for, for months uh, rather than weeks. Um, so we'll, we'll touch upon that in a second. Uh, Really, really good news. Uh, most people were feeling extremely confident that uh, member benefits were going to get paid. And really, that's kind of at the core of everything, isn't it? Just making sure that members get paid. Uh, and that kind of instills a lot of confidence um, in pensions and saving generally. Uh, and, and obviously, lots of vulnerable uh, savers out there who, who are relying on their pension at this time. So it's so a great news. Um, and hopefully, uh, that will continue. Thank you all for, for feeding into that survey. There will be a longer one coming your way shortly, so please do uh, fill that out. Uh, Rachel, over to you. Right, so um, we had a lot of questions that were sent in, so it's exciting to get to some of them. The overwhelming number of questions and the most voted question is a DC question, Laura, so you are the lucky one today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about the confusion around the furlough and the contribution on the furlough. So understand that the furlough grant will only pay minimum AE contributions, for example, 3% of the 80%, sorry, 3% on the 80%. Are employers who use salary sacrifice obliged to pay contributions to the scheme as if the employer was being on full normal pay, just as they are for maternity pay? And do you have any worked examples? So um, I can understand why there's questions on this and that's because there is no guidance on this. Um, so uh, unfortunately, you're in a difficult situation. Um, over the weekend, HMRC did issue guidance uh, particularly around salary sacrifice, um, classing COVID-19 as a life event, so similar to getting married, so that actually employees can opt out of salary sacrifice at this point, which is normally not allowable unless there is a life event. Um, what I would recommend is that people look at their actual salary sacrifice agreements. So, for example, if the contract between the employer and their employee says that actually it's going to be 10% of salary at a certain date, you'd need to follow that along, where if it's 10% of salary um, is the pension contribution, for example, as at a certain month, um, then the, the furloughing would reduce the contributions just as it would do if you weren't taking salary sacrifice, so in the normal circumstances. Um, so it seems that what HMRC are saying now is that the furlough um, amount would be before salary sacrifice based on the 28th of February date. But I can understand why there's such a lot of confusion out there on this because it's very fast moving. Um, it was put in place without all the guidance. Um, so it's good to see that HMRC has clarified some of the points over the weekend, but I do still think there are some points that need to further clarification. 
Can I just add in, Rachel, I think this is a question that's come up a lot with uh, uh, members and also uh, something we've raised with, with DWP. I'm hoping um, there'll be some additional guidance from DWP in the next couple of days. Um, whether it answers all the questions or, or maybe just some of them um, will be uh, to be seen, but um, they've, they've got it on their radar. Um, I think it's just a question of uh, getting through a lot of, uh, lot of answers at a Q&A very quickly. Rachel, are you on mute? Yes, I might have been. Thanks. So <laughs> next most question is um, a voted up question is around document handling, electronic signatures. How can schemes be, is there any flexibility being built in and members who may not have the IT set up at home they need to, to execute documents at this time? So obviously there's been quite a lot of guidance around electronic signatures and those should be now being um, accepted in terms of um, administration programs. It can be difficult in terms of looking at members, but things like um, um, there's quite a lot of um, DocuSign kind of um, programs and stuff that can help with some of some of this. Um, so hopefully that some processes will be able to be able to do, be done electronically. Um, I don't know if anyone from the schemes has had any experience with this. So I'll, I'll not from scheme, but something that's kind of raised uh, its uh, head through discussions. Um, we had a discussion with our legal panel about it very recently as well. Um, I think, uh, as Laura says, there are lots of electronic uh, solutions out there and people, some people have been using those, some people are using them now. Uh, just be careful that your trustee and rules as well and your um, any other articles allow you to do allow you to do this there will be probably some that have been uh, not been updated for some while that wet signatures are going to be required and, and you might need to think about ways around that um, that's obviously going to be quite problematic uh, given the restrictions on on movement and, and, and other things but um, where possible um, check see what you can do see what workarounds apply um, and if need to be, try and make some, some changes or um, uh, take a, a pragmatic approach as you can. I, I, I had some experience of this today, actually, and I'm not going to name and acclaim one of our providers, but they normally would have insisted on wet signatures, but, but we went back and said, look, this isn't going to be possible apart from anything else. My kids wouldn't let me on the computer to scan. And, <laughs> and they, they, were, they, were, they were happy to do that. So I think that, that where, where the rules allow, there needs to be flexibility. Um, and we also need to make sure that our decision-making process is nimble enough in order to change our own, our own decision-making making issues. Great. And um, Stuart, I think this one's for you. For communication about scams, what should trustees be doing in addition to the measures that are already in place for transfers? Obviously, it's a kind of a wild and woolly landscape right now. Oh, yes, I mean, I think, I don't think there's any danger of over communicating in this space. Um, I mean, there's clearly you can push them towards the scam smart um, page. There is, I, I think the only the, other than communicating, I think the other part of it is um, looking at um, the policy around paying transfer values. I mean, a lot of schemes are looking at suspending transfers anyway, uh, DB schemes. Um, just due to um, sheer numbers, financial repercussions, um, particularly with markets being so volatile. Uh, and that, you know, different trustees will take different viewpoints on that. But I think that is also part of it about whether they are um, the appropriateness of um, putting in additional checks around transfers at this time. And generally, I think a lot of administrators, from a, certainly from a DB point of view, but not only will be prioritizing or thinking about prioritizing things like, well, unfortunately death claims, but also um, retirements uh, and paying pensioners rather than necessarily uh, transfer values at the time being. Thanks for that. Um, the next question, Neil, can you, it's kind of a big question, but 
um, can you give a short answer to a big question, but what do you think is the, the largest challenge for the LGPS that will come out of the pandemic? Obviously, lots of people in the LGPS will be classed as essential employees. Um, in my view, the, the biggest challenge is going to be what, what local government looks like um, after this event and what the, 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 how many of our employers are going to be left providing essential community services unless we take a proportion of you. That's, that's to me the biggest challenge. All right, and then another question, uh, defined contributions are all well and good, but if you are an airline and your fleet is grounded, your ability to pay pension scheme contributions during this period may be permanently lost. Are the authorities proposing any special relief for such situations? Sounds like a Joe or a Stuart question. Stuart, yeah, um, to stab at it yeah sure, I'm happy to, to take, so yeah, so um, def I, um, I mean, it's interesting, the regulator's guidance, I think, has been quite helpful in this regard because, you know, there's very much a kind of focus on a being pragmatic, trustees, advisors, everyone being pragmatic, um, where there's good reason, where it's necessary to defer or postpone cash contributions going into DB schemes. Um, certainly for three months on a temporary period, um, almost when I kind of no questions asked, but, you know, not, not quite that extreme. But, but the, the, the regulator also cites, um, you know, it may be necessary for some companies, for some schemes to look at renegotiating an existing schedule of contributions because they recognize that, you know, even if things, you know, even if this lockdown ceases in three months time or four months time, you know, the repercussions of this could be much longer period. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, I think for some companies in the right circumstances, and clearly trustees would then need to look at that more carefully and need more information, would um, be entertaining the idea of renegotiating an existing schedule, which would give that, um, that, that uh, relief, if that makes sense. Joe, did you have something to add to that? I think I, think I agree with uh, everything Stuart said. I think um, on the whole, it will be a sort of Horses for courses approach, and, and there will be some uh, industries that are more affected than others, and there'll be different measures, I think, for different industries that we'll see. We haven't seen any uh, direct um, support uh, necessarily coming through from government for, for, for particular industries yet, um, but that was something that was certainly on the radar for um, parts of parts of the parts of sectors in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. So. And we're very likely, if things come to that, to see it for per certain parts of industry going forward. Um, but I think you will have to just make um, the best decision on the information that's available at the time um, and, and go with that. And, and, and if necessary, it's worth having a conversation with uh, with any of the regulators involved before you make uh, make a decision. You don't need to make a decision without having had that conversation, certainly in that type of industry, uh, that type of sector. So, well, thanks for that. I think we've gotten through all the questions and thanks to all of you for joining us today um, and the panelists and thank you all as an audience for being here. Um, there's a couple of extra questions. We're gonna send them around to the panelists and make the answers available to everyone listening. I hope you felt today was useful. It's the first in a series of webinars that the PLSA will be hosting. I've just sent you links to two upcoming ones. The next one, April 16th, is on communicating with members during the crisis. And on the 28th of April, we're going to have a Q&A with David Fares of TPR. Um, so we hope you'll join us. There's links to where you can get more information and register. Um, and thank you so much for joining today. Please look after yourselves. We hope to see you in person before too long. Um, this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending around the uh, link to that very soon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.